It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, our top story. In his spring budget, Jeremy Hunt cuts national insurance and extends child benefit as he battles for votes before the general election. A plan to make work pay versus no plan. Growth up, jobs up, taxes down. I commend this statement to the House. Help for higher earning parents, but what about those on lower incomes? We get reaction from our election target town, Cleethorpes. Also tonight, two crew members are dead after a suspected Houthi rebel attack on a tanker off the coast of Yemen. A near miss for President Zelensky as a Russian missile hits Odessa during his meeting there with the Greek Prime Minister. Nikki Haley pulls out of the Republican race for the White House, making way for a Trump-Biden rematch in November. I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. Although I'm a lifelong Republican, I wouldn't vote for Donald Trump. He was running for dog catcher. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in our press preview from 10.30 right through to midnight. Hello there, good evening. It was always billed as a pre-election Big Bang budget and there were high expectations, perhaps a moment for the government to win over voters. The leaked cut to national insurance was, as predicted, today's headline offer. And Jeremy Hunt indicated that he's aiming to cut it all together in the long term. There was also good news for families with children who will benefit from a change to the child benefit threshold. And there were a couple of ideas stolen from the opposition too. So in more detail then, the Chancellor told MPs that national insurance will be cut by 2p in the pound from April. The high income child benefit threshold will be raised from £50,000 to £60,000. The VAT registration threshold for businesses will increase to £90,000. The NHS will receive nearly £6 billion, including £3.4 billion, dedicated to updating its IT systems. Mr Hunt announced the abolition of the non-DOM status when a person lives in the UK but does not pay tax on foreign income, taking Labour's policy plan, which will raise £2.7 billion a year. The windfall tax on oil and gas companies will be extended until March 2029, also a Labour promise. A new duty on vaping products will be introduced in 2026 and there's to be a one-off increase in tobacco duty. The five pence cut to fuel duty remains for another year. And the alcohol duty freeze continues until February 2025. Well, tonight we'll get the details of what the budget means for the economy and also whether these measures will make a difference to people in our election target towns, Grimsby and Cleethorpes. Our first report tonight comes from our political editor, Beth Rigby. A pre-election budget, this moment as much about the politics as the economics. This may be the last chance to shift the dial for a Conservative Party 20 points behind in the polls. A huge opportunity for this Chancellor and one matched with big expectations from his party and the public. We can now help families not just with temporary cost of living support, but with permanent cuts in taxation. Yeah. But the only big cut in this budget was two percentage points off national insurance. This a repeat of Mr Hunt's big giveaway last November that failed to move the polls. And his other more modest move changes to child benefit to help higher earners. From this April, the high income child benefit charge threshold will be raised from 50,000 to 60,000 pounds. There were some new taxes too on vaping, business class plane tickets and holiday lets and a new measure to abolish tax breaks for so-called non-DOMs who live in the UK with a permanent home overseas. It was a policy taken from the opposition benches and made the Chancellor's own. The government will abolish the current tax system for non-DOMs. Get rid of the outdated concept. The Prime Minister looking pleased with a budget he's understood to have been heavily involved in. Sir Keir Starmer. Yeah. 
but Labour quick to point voters back to an unprecedented tax burden set by a Tory government. Britain in recession, the national credit card maxed out and despite the measures today, the highest tax burden for 70 years. Discontent from his own side too after hopes of an income tax cut failed to materialise. I've constantly been urging the Prime Minister to change course and be a bit you know, more vivid and a bit bolder and in the spirit of delivering what the British people have voted for. We're supposed to be the party of low tax, but we've overseen a, the highest tax burden in 70 years. And I think now was a real opportunity whereby a, a cut to income tax would have sent that message. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, budget delivered the PM and his Chancellor straight out on a visit to a builder's merchant. The question is, have voters simply stopped listening? Did you catch any of Jeremy's budget? Yeah, right. No, you're working too hard. The message of today's modest tax cuts could prove a hard sell. Hi, Beth. Hi, Chancellor. Nice to see you. Likewise. Very How nice are you to doing? See you. Very good. Though. We've just had your budget. We don't know when the general election will be, but is this your last throw of the dice? Absolutely not. Um, we have produced today a budget that shows that we are turning a corner. Uh, we have had a plan since the time I became Chancellor to bring down inflation and restore growth. Mm. And the, the changes that we've made today on national insurance, uh, combined with what we did in the autumn, mean that we'll fill around one in five uh, vacancies will, in the I economy. Will, I will come back to the tax burden because the OBR forecasts show that it's going to be going to the highest level in 70 years by the end of the forecast. What I want to ask you now, though, is should we expect another fiscal event before a general election or is this it? Well, that depends when the Prime Minister decides to call the election. Um, but uh, whenever that is, uh, you know, and that is the, the key point, you've just talked about the tax burden, so let me just address that point. Um, of course, taxes have gone up because we spent uh, over £400 billion helping families through the pandemic and through a cost of living crisis. If you were looking for pre-election fireworks in this budget, well, look away now. Jeremy Hunt chose fiscal responsibility over political excitement. The long shadow of Liz Truss's mini-budget still looms large. What the Chancellor wants to show you is that the Tories can be trusted on the economy and they will cut your taxes. But here's the rub. The overall tax burden in our nation is still going up and households on average are going to be worse off going into the next general election than they were the last time they went to the polls. This a budget that could well struggle to bring about political renewal. Already talk around here of another fiscal event later in the year before an autumn general election. The March budget done, but still no spring in the Tory step. Beth Rigby, Sky News, Westminster. And we'll hear more from Beth later in the programme. Well, today's budget comes against a backdrop of the UK approaching the highest tax burden for 70 years. Our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, has been looking at how the numbers add up. It wasn't an enormous budget, but there was still quite a lot of detail to go through. First of all, on the state of the economy, gross domestic product, these numbers here, they got a bit of an upgrade. So that's what was forecast last time around. And the higher these bars are, the better the economy is doing. You can see, look, these bars are a little bit higher. So stronger economic growth, even though there is a recession that we're going through right now. But partly, that's down to higher migration. So it's down to a higher population. But really, the big story the Chancellor wanted to talk about was the fact that he said this is a tax-cutting budget. Is it a tax-cutting budget? Well, in one sense it is. This is showing you the tax burden. So the amount, the extent to which the UK is a high-tax economy, going all the way back to the 1940s. Last time around, look at that line. It was going up to the highest level since 1948. This time, the line, well, it's going up less quickly, but it's still at that very high level that we haven't seen uh, since World War II. And why is that happening? Well, think about it, OK? This, these bars are basically showing you the impact of uh, all of those tax rises that we've had recently. And the, the main kind of force of those tax rises is what they call fiscal drag. Basically, more people being dragged into higher tax brackets. So those bars going down means people are paying more in taxation. Then you had last autumn statement, uh, the cut in NICS, though the first cut in national insurance, that meant those bars were less 
far down. But you can see they're still in this kind of pink area that constitutes people getting less well off. It wasn't a giveaway in net terms. Same thing again this time around. So the bars go a little bit higher, but it's still in negative territory. People staying, still paying more in taxation, and that's why that line is still going up. It's worth saying, if we just look at the breakdown of this budget as well, there were quite a lot of measures here uh, in terms of money coming in there. So you had that non-DOM reform, about £6.8 billion pounds worth of measures bringing money into the Exchequer, mostly non-DOMs, uh, and you also had the energy tax uh, levy as well. So both two kind of Labour policies people uh, would point out. But by far and away, the biggest thing bringing in money was this national insurance bringing in rather a lot of money and dwarfing pretty much everything else. It wasn't quite as wide, as deep a budget as a lot of people had expected. And part of the reason for that, for the lack of ambition, is the fact the government didn't have that much room to play with. It's got these fiscal rules. On the basis of the fiscal rules, these rules constraining how much they can borrow, they had about £13 billion to start with until they would break the rules. The OBR came along, the Office of Budget Responsibility, said, actually, the economy, public finance is doing get worse. So they downgraded them. So they had less room to work with before they came to the actual sums. Then they did their spending, so what you've just seen there, national insurance and all of that, and now they only have £8.9 billion to play with. And if we just look at that in context, in historical context, that amount of headroom against the fiscal rules is one of the lowest we've seen for any chancellor in a long time. Raising the question, even if Jeremy Hunt did want to spend more in a pre-election event, how much more could he actually spend? Ed Conway there. Well, two towns where the government will hope to win over voters are Grimsby and Cleethorpes on the Lincolnshire coast. And in the run-up to the election, they are our target towns. Our national correspondent, Tom Parmenter, has been speaking to people there to see if they feel better or worse off after today's budget. Every day, Mike gets into the sea at Cleethorpes. To connect with people through videos and spread some positivity. Morning, morning. Community is everything. So it's more important than ever that we stick together. Budget day may be about the numbers, but it's so much more than that. For me, it comes down to one word, hope. Do you know, hope that you know things are going to change and that they can get behind something and believe in it. And I think they need to be able to touch and feel it, do you know, and see how it's going to change their life. In neighbouring Grimsby, at a play session that's free for families, the Chancellor's outlook didn't tally with theirs. The national insurance cut will help Sally's partners take home pay, but not their spending power. It still quickly disappears because obviously the cost of living goes up. That doesn't really change anything. So many families here in the West Marsh area of town are just surviving each month. I don't think today the budget's helped anybody dramatically at all. And, it, you know, it's, I think it, what it is, it's an election pitch. But they've taken so much away that in this point leading up to an election, I don't see how they can ever give money back that will really help. Because anything they give is swallowed up just like that. Expanding child benefit to reach more families earning up to 60,000 a year is a win for some. But not Alexandra, whose partner has his own electrical business. I think the child benefit is fair enough. It might not affect us, but I think the major thing for people is the childcare costs. The Chancellor did reiterate they are helping on childcare and investing in every corner of the country. There are big plans for the docks in Grimsby, but at the art club in a community cafe here, Chelsea had expected much more. We'll help you, we're going to get it better, the budget's going to go down, this is going to go down, but then it's not, because in a month later it's gone up again. So is it coming down or is it just going up? Either way, you can't, you can't win, can you? It's just... Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not picking up as a country, we're going back. There were bits and pieces from this budget, but put together, it hasn't changed the mood here. The drag on the nation's finances runs deep. Tom Parmenter, Sky News, Grimsby. And we'll be back in Grimsby and Cleethorpes in the weeks and months to come in this election year. Well, let's speak to our political editor, Beth Rigby, now, who's in Downing Street. Uh, budget certainly with an eye on the voters, Beth. Did it whimper then or did it woo? What's your take? 
Well, Anna, look, this was a moment when we are a few months out from a general election and the Conservatives are so far behind in the polls. This was a moment to try and boost popularity and have a political win. But I think we've come out the other side tonight with the party certainly feeling flat rather than elated. Why is that? I think it's partly about the delivery. Uh, a two percentage point cut in national insurance is a £10 billion tax cut for 27 million workers. But because that was briefed out ahead of the budget, so many MPs thought that there would be something more, maybe another pence off national insurance or a cut to income tax. So they were disappointed. I think there was also a view that when you're that far behind in the polls, you need to take some risk. But this was a Chancellor true to form, putting financial and fiscal responsibility above all else. And he, aware of the fragile public finances, decided to go safety first. This was a safety first budget. Now, in normal times, MPs might swallow that, but when they're staring down the barrel of an electoral uh, abyss, as many of them see it, this uh, brings about nerves. So I think they did expect more, but uh, Jeremy Hunt wasn't willing to give it. Now, I think the big question is, given that the party's 20 points behind in the polls, will it shift the dial? I mean, insiders in number 10 would ch tell me in the run-up to this, they didn't think it was a poll game-changer. Senior uh, Tories tonight, former cabinet ministers telling me, one saying they think it will make zero difference, another saying it won't shift the needle. So the perception around here, at least, is this is not an electioneering budget. So where does it leave the government and the party? Look, I think you have to see this as a building block, as the Conservative Party would put it, or certainly the leadership, on the path to an election where they want to argue the economy's improving. So you had national insurance cuts in January. You've got another set in April. That's when energy bills start coming down. And then look at the forecast, interest rates. Inflation will be going down perhaps to 2% in the summer. Does the Bank of England then cut interest rates? Does that benefit mortgage uh, uh, payers. And then look at Jeremy Hunt, what he said today, that this was not the last roll of the die. Is there going to be another fiscal event to allow the government to try to get closer to Labour in the polls? But I think that tonight, whilst Tory MPs, most of them, will try and sit on their hands publicly, privately, their heads are in their hands because they are so far behind in the polls and they don't think, I think, that the Chancellor has given them much uh, to change that narrative uh, with an election now looking just months away. Beth Rigby, with that assessment, live from Downing Street, thank you. And if you want to know if you are richer or poorer after the budget, then do scan the QR code on the screen now to find out by using our budget calculator. Two sailors have been killed following a missile attack by Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. These are the first deaths since the Yemeni-based fighters started attacking vessels in one of the world's busiest shipping lanes and comes despite an international naval security operation. Our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, has more. The latest victim of high seas Houthi hostile action in what was this time a fatal attack. The vessel, True Confidence in Better Times, struck on the same day as the Houthis took on the US Navy and attacked one of its destroyers, the USS Kearney, with attacker bomb drones. With its Red Sea strategy clearly not succeeding in Washington, the US government had this response to the lethal attack on the unarmed merchant vessel. Today, the Houthis have killed innocent civilians by continuing their reckless attacks against international commercial shipping, which impacts countries throughout the world. These reckless attacks by the Iran-backed Houthis have not only disrupted global trade and commerce, but also taken the lives of international sea, uh, seafarers simply doing their jobs. We offer our condolences, obviously, to the families of those who lost their lives and again condemn the Houthis for these attacks. In a tweet, the British Embassy in Sana'a, Yemen, reported at least two innocent sailors have died, calling it sad but inevitable. Britain and America said airstrikes started six weeks ago would degrade and deter the Houthi attacks. In fact, they're getting worse. 
Since the attacks began, more than 40 ships have been hit or hijacked. But the last seven days have been particularly disastrous. The first to sink going down over the weekend with toxic fertilizer on board. Then an Indian vessel set on fire on Monday and now the first fatalities. The Houthis appear to be running rings around US-British efforts to stop them. One of the world's busiest shipping lanes, now its most dangerous, where vessels and now lives are in growing danger, with no end in sight to the Houthis' aggression. And Dominic joins me now. So strong words from the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, tonight, Dominic, both on Yemen after those fatalities and on aid getting into Gaza. Yeah, absolutely, Anna. Yes, yeah. so on, on Yemen, he says this in a tweet, uh, we condemn the Houthis' reckless and indiscriminate attacks on global shipping and demand they stop. And the problem with that, of course, is that those efforts to stop Houthi attacks seem to have made the matter worse, arguably. They have not deterred and degraded uh, the Houthis' ability to launch these attacks. In fact, today they took on the American Navy and, and killed for the first time merchant seamen on that other cargo uh, vessel. They will say to the government, well, what can they do? They've got to do something. They have to uh, attack the Houthis. But I think the problem is that it is provoking the Houthis into doing their worst, and they're clearly not degrading their capability, firing a number of uh, bomb-laden drones at that US destroyer and also an anti-ship ballistic missile. So it's a real dilemma, I think, for the British and the Americans as to where they move next with their airstrikes against uh, the Houthis. But, yes, also meeting Benny Gantz. Now, he is a rival of Benjamin Netanyahu, but also a decorated general and former Minister of Defence, and he sits in the war cabinet with Benjamin Netanyahu. But he went to Washington this week and to London without the Prime Minister's blessing. And I think that was a sign of the, the lack of patience, the, the fact that patience is wearing thin, both in Washington and London, with what Israel is doing, particularly on the issue of humanitarian aid. The, the, the statement from the Foreign Office following that meeting was pretty strident in its tone. It said, we need to see an immediate humanitarian pause, increased capacity for aid distribution inside Gaza, increased access through both land and, and uh, maritime routes. But I think the, 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 the tone that will most, I think, strike both Gantz and Netanyahu listening back here is when he says this, the UK supports Israel's right to self-defence, as you'd expect, but as the occupying power in Gaza, Israel has a legal responsibility to ensure aid is available for civilians. Up to now, America and Britain have kind of given Israel a free pass on this issue that as occupying powers, they should be guaranteeing humanitarian aid, allowing the Israelis to outsource that to aid agencies and the UN. I think they're now putting pressure on the Israelis, saying you've got to have a plan for what happens next, otherwise you will remain the occupying power in Gaza indefinitely and you have this responsibility to deal with the humanitarian situation, which you are simply not doing enough to honour at the moment. Dominic, live there in Jerusalem. Thank you. Five people were killed today when a missile exploded in the Ukrainian city of Odessa while President Zelensky was meeting the Greek Prime Minister. They were looking around the war-damaged city when they heard the explosion. Sources said it was less than 800 metres away. Neither of the leaders were harmed. I believe me and Kyriakos heard it. We saw this strike today. You see who we're dealing with? They don't care where to hit. I know that there were victims today. I don't know all the details yet, but I know that there are dead and wounded. To the United States now, where it seems no one can stop Donald Trump from becoming the Republican Party's presidential nominee. The former president's only remaining rival, Nikki Haley, has now bowed out of the race, setting up a Trump-Biden rematch in November's election. Our US correspondent, James Matthews, sent this report from Charlottesville, Virginia, one of the only counties that voted more heavily for Haley than for Trump. You might call this place Trump versus Biden, ground zero. Charlottesville, Virginia, is where a white nationalist rally sparked riots in 2017 with fatal consequences. Donald Trump said there were fine people on both sides. Joe Biden said those remarks inspired him to run for president in 2020. Cue the rerun in 2024. There was no Trump endorsement from Nikki Haley as she pulled out of the Republican race there was a reference to a former British Prime Minister. I have always been a conservative Republican and always supported the Republican nominee. But on this question, as she did on so many others, Margaret Thatcher provided some good advice when she said, quote, never just follow the crowd, always make up your own mind. 
The crowd that followed Haley is the crowd Trump will need. Charlottesville is a city in a county among few in Virginia that backed Nikki Haley. Where does her vote go now? We asked Haley supporters downtown. <laughs> I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. Although I'm a lifelong Republican, I wouldn't vote for Donald Trump. He was running for dog catcher. Why? You, you, how much time do you have? He's deranged. He's a threat to humankind, to the planet, to the world, to world peace. I will not vote for Trump. Why not? I don't trust that man. I wouldn't trust that man to be in my house, and I wouldn't in my personal house with my wife or my daughter, and I wouldn't trust him in the White House either. Super Tuesday was just another Tuesday in much of America. Donald Trump's advance, a foregone conclusion. Close the borders, fix the econ economy, give us back some law and order, some respect. He doesn't represent what I, what I would stand for. Not things I would stand for, no. I did vote for him four years or eight years ago, um, but I really don't know that he is what we need in this country right now again. That I'm proud to be an American. Donald Trump's Super Tuesday speech was a call for unity as he eyes the presidential election. I've been saying lately, success will bring unity to our country, and it happened before. We had the best economy our country's ever had. And so the United States has a presidential rematch. It's first for 70 years, and almost certainly it's most negative. Already, both men are shaping the next eight months as a referendum on the other. All while polls reflect a public despair at the presidential choice, in which for both men, weakness is seen to outweigh strength. James Matthews, Sky News, in Charlottesville, Virginia. So let's go live then to our US correspondent, Mark Stone, who's in Washington. So, Mark, a Trump route, Haley gone, and now, as we heard there, the rematch. Yes, look, you know, the pundits here uh, in America uh, are trying to spin this, either overstating Donald Trump's success or understating it. But, but objectively, this was a, really was a super Tuesday uh, for a man uh, who has been written off, written off after he last, lost the last election, written off during the midterms, written off because of all the baggage and all the court cases, and yet he now dominates. He is the only one left standing on the Republican uh, side. But beyond that, I don't think either Donald Trump or Joe Biden should be complacent. I mean, you heard it there in James's report. What happens to those people? A significant number in states across the country who voted yesterday, who are Republican, who are conservative, but they don't like Donald Trump and they chose Nikki Haley. What will they do in November? Will they fall in line? Well, those in, J in James's report certainly won't. There will be many other never Trumpers uh, across the country as well. And that's critical because if it is a race between Biden and Trump in November, the polls suggest that it will be very close. If people don't turn out uh, for Donald Trump, either just not going to the voting uh, halls or indeed voting for Joe Biden, then he is in real trouble. Trouble. Biden, too, can't be complacent. He is one trip up, one slip up away from big disaster. The focus here, to ne the next focus here will be tomorrow night in that building, the place where the riot, the insurrection supposedly uh, called for by Donald Trump, the, 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 the subject of a court case. The focus in there tomorrow will be Joe Biden's State of the Union address, that keynote speech. It is being described as a reset moment for Joe Biden, the moment that he can capture the nation uh, and explain why he really is the one for the election in 2024. Full coverage of that to come. Mark, thank you. Now, the opening ceremony of the Paris Olympics this summer will be closed to both tourists and Parisians. The French government has said the potential terror threat meant the event along the Seine River will be invitation only, with guests subject to security checks. Sky Sports correspondent Rob Harris reports now. Paris is preparing to produce the world's biggest live show, a first Olympic opening ceremony through a city on water. A spectacular stage on the Seine for athletes, but there are just 20 weeks to deliver these games safely. There's still a lot of work, indeed. Sky um, News was given exclusive access today to a major logistical meeting, the last before the Games with a global mix of sports officials and athletes hearing from Olympic chiefs. 
just as the French government ordered the ambitious plans to be scaled back. The growing terror threat reduced in the numbers allowed on the banks of the river to watch the ceremony, with free tickets now invitation only. Busy time. Busy time indeed. But yeah. the International Olympic great. Committee is determined to retain the ambition without unnecessary risk. When would the plan become too risky to go ahead with it being staged through Paris? You cannot plan for uh, a, a plan B. It, it, it's far uh, too, uh, um, uh, far too big, too, too sophisticated, too complex artistically to uh, look at a plan B in an other location. Plan B, again, is reducing, adjusting, but it's that location. You see, the, uh, these games were, were always designed around the highest possible uh, security threat and, and security level. Global conflicts and geopolitical tensions are increasing the threat on the ground, online and from the skies, with all Paris airspace closing throughout the opening ceremony. Some here fear security rather than sport taking over their city. In the means for security that will be taken that are very, very heavy. And uh, Paris will be full of soldiers, full of... I'm sorry for Paris, it's not a good uh, advertising for my own city, which I love a lot. They've been planning this unique opening ceremony here on the Seine for years, but the vast open setting as athletes parade down the river poses huge security challenges. And there are concerns the spectacular plans could be too great a risk. Olympic chiefs are determined to keep plans afloat for a spectacular opening ceremony with unprecedented scale and threat. Rob Harris, Sky News, Paris. Well, that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the press preview. Tonight, we're joined by the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin Maguire, and the Daily Telegraph's deputy comment editor, Annabelle Denham. Welcome to both of you. Yeah. Uh, among the stories we'll be discussing... Not really a surprise, is it? Uh, this on the front page of the Financial Times after today's budget. Their headline, Hunt leaves the door open to more tax cuts. Plenty more on that, uh, more analysis to come back in a moment.
Well, this is Sky News. In just a moment, the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. First, though, a reminder of our top stories. The Chancellor has announced a 2p cut in national insurance, help for families and the abolition of non-DOM tax arrangements. Labour said it was a con and people would be hit by a Tory stealth tax through council tax increases. Two sailors have been killed following a missile attack by Houthi rebels on an American ship in the Red Sea. And Nikki Haley, Donald Trump's last rival in the contest to become the Republican presidential candidate, has said she will suspend her campaign but did not endorse Mr. Trump. <coughs> Hello there, watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin McGuire, and the Daily Telegraph's deputy comment editor, Annabel Denham, with us from now until just before midnight with lots to say, no doubt. So to the front pages, starting with the Financial Times, Hunt leaves the door open to more tax cuts. Uh, their headline following today's budget saying that Jeremy Hunt could yet make more cuts before a general election is called. The Guardian says Britain will now go into the next general election with the highest level of taxation since 1948, despite the cut in national insurance. Annabelle's paper, The Telegraph, says that that cut, in fact, signals the end of national insurance for good at some point in the future. The Times picks up on that point too, with the Chancellor calling national insurance an unfair tax he'd like to abolish. The Metro says the Chancellor decided to cut and run, setting out the battle lines for the general election and pulling the rug from under Labour's own policies. But asks the Daily Mail, will this be enough to see off Labour? The Eye says Labour has now decided not to raise taxes for the wealthy if it comes to power, even though they could be a £20 billion black hole in the country's finances by then. This is the verdict of Kevin's paper, The Mirror, We Deserve Better. The Express, more supportive. Britain ready for takeoff. <laughs> the headline there, and it's cut contrast, isn't it? Uh, while the Daily Star leads with new research showing that men who eat fatty foods, such as a full English, are more attractive to women. I'm more intrigued by hug a slug at the top, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, anyway, reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you listen to our guests, Kevin McGuire and Annabel Denham. So, fascinating. Um, quick take, first of all, your verdict. Kevin? Underwhelming. Uh, I don't think it will change the, uh, you know, the political game. You look at the Daily Mail, whenever they put a question mark in a headline, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Annabel? Mm. I agree with Kevin. It didn't feel like the last budget before we go to the polls, did it? So mm. it, it had a short-term feel to it. To me, I suspect there might be another fiscal event before voters go to the polls where a rabbit will be pulled out of the hat because there certainly wasn't one of those yeah, today. You know, in the future, I think Jeremy Hunt could just send round a whole load of uh, press cuttings because we just uh, had it all yeah. in advance. Yes, yeah, so, and so why? Why? Why did that happen? And did that diminish? I mean, if you look at the Matt cartoon in The Telegraph tonight, it's a rabbit at a bar with the public and going, not out the hat again, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that, that's the point for many people. But still, yeah. some fascinating details. Um, let's kick off this idea... Oh, there we are. So not pulled out of the hat again. Thank you very much <laughs> for getting that. There it is indeed. Um, which has certainly been the sense for many people because of the leaking and uh, the, the, the pre-briefings that we've had. Um, so let's head to the Financial Times. Hunt leaves the door open to more tax cuts. Um, your paper, The Telegraph, as well. Hunt signals the end of national insurance. Um, is, is this what it's about now? Is is it squeezing out national insurance for good, do you think, Annabelle? Well, I certainly hope so. I would like us to see us remove national insurance altogether, not just on the What's employee side, but on the employer side as well. I think a fundamental problem with national insurance is that most people believe that they are paying towards a, a pot for their retirement, which, of course, they're not. It's just essentially another form of income tax. And in that regard, I feel as though the government is being slightly dishonest with taxpayers. It's also a tax on working. It can disincentivise people people from uh, taking, up, uh, taking a job or working longer hours. Um, and the, 
so I'm in favour of removing it. However, it's going to be extremely costly uh, to do so. Uh, £5 billion pounds for every uh, 1p which is taken off, um, which is, is significant given the parlous state of the public finances. So whilst I support um, Hunt signalling the end of NI, I wonder how realistic and achievable it will be. It, it, it's, a, it's a qualifying payment, though, for the state pension. You've got a, uh, 35 years for a full state pension. Um, some unemployment benefits, out-work benefits, it's all for, you know, a gateway to those. So that would have to be looked at. But I think the real question, if you get rid of it, is what, how do you fill the gap? It's 45 billion, I think, is the figure if you get rid of it for um, employees. Employers, it's much higher because they pay 13.8%. Uh, for every pound over 175, I think it is. It's something like that. You mm. you get. I mean, that hasn't been that hasn't been cut. That's 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 still high. And I think it's one of the government's big big earners. It's something like 170 billion. It was maybe it's come down now with these 10 billion cuts that two for employees. But that's a huge amount. So it's more than like the health budget. So what are you going to do? Shut down the NHS? How are you, you know, genuinely? How are you going to pay for it? And. We mustn't forget that, despite the fact that Ed Conway did the figures, you know, the tax has gone up 6.8 billion, 13.2 billion um, cuts. So there's a, yeah, yeah, so there's a slightly bigger cut in this, but taxes are still going up. Mm. So when you see the FT, Hunt leaves a door open to more tax cuts, well, they're still increasing taxes. They're still increasing how much they take from you. So it's not actually, I mean, it's, it's, the cut really is they're just going to be taking a bit less than they were from you, but it's well, still going to be groups, a rise. Of course, yeah. but they're going to Across raise the economy, it in, though, yeah. Other, yeah. in other ways. Um, and the main way that they're doing that is through fiscal drag, mm. which yeah. hasn't yeah. been addressed. So we have these thro frozen thresholds which are not moving in line with inflation. And mm -hmm. the OBR suggests that the government could be pulling in an additional £40 billion a year mm -hmm. through fiscal drag by 28, 29. Yeah, I, 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 it's a yeah. massive sum of money. Personally, I have no objection to the overall tax take going up. I know it's going up to a rate. It's going to shock you, and uh, yeah, the highest since was it 1948. Eight, but other yeah. successful, more successful economies have a higher take. It's just who who do you take it from? Mm. And there's nothing. You know, there's no radical thinking in sort of equalising capital gains tax with income tax, or well, even Labour like has ruled out equalising oh, yeah, capital well, gains we'll tax. We'll get on to that. Um, Everything Labour's ruled yeah. out, which but I think the, is a mistake. But the the yeah. idea of these tax thresholds: the more people are going up with inflation, you're likely yeah. to have a wage increase, which puts puts you up. Um, the OBR's figures uh, by 2028-29, the uh, the dates you quoted. 2.7 million more higher rate taxpayers and 600,000 more additional rate mm -hmm. taxpayers. So huge numbers of people are finding themselves in a different tax bracket for their earnings above that level. Um, so the idea of thresholds, again, being frozen has certainly upset very many people. No, it just feels a bit like a sleight of hand. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Like it's, it's, national insurance, but we're still pulling yeah. you into these tax the, brackets. People on the minimum more. wage. Yeah. Soon people who just have a state pension will fall in uh, to the... To the bracket, it cuts in at uh, twelve and a half thousand. You pay, you start paying income tax. The state pension now is beginning to nudge that level. Yeah. So let's take a look at the Daily Express. Um, I think you laughed, Kevin, when uh, when it came on. <laughs> uh, Britain ready uh, for takeoff. <laughs> but the point the point is, what we what we started to see here was this, was an indication of what the Tories' message will be for the election, which is that we've turned a corner on inflation and soon on growth in the economy. That was kind of the suggestion, wasn't it? That's right, but it's quite difficult to make such a suggestion when we know think we're it's in a technical wrong. recession. Um, now, it's possible by the time we found out that we were in a technical recession, had gone into one at the end of last year, that actually we were coming out of it already. But nonetheless, it's a difficult story to sell. And as I say, I think this was quite a short-termist budget, I, I didn't feel as though the Tories set out a long-term plan for growth in the economy, a, a vision for the economy, and well, to well, the well, Daily Express. There was, there was the idea that the UK would be a great um, environment for investment, for example, in the tech industry, or film and TV, with a mention of our fantastic Sky Studios as well. So there, there were elements of that, wasn't there, weren't there, don't you think? Yeah, I remember no. Gordon Brown. <laughs> I remember Gordon Brown doing that rather regularly. You're from the supportive wasn't it? paper, what's yeah, going but, on? But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Express, along with some of the papers, backed the Liz Trust budget of two years ago. That was a 45 billion tax cut. It was far bigger. That was all going to take off. They all hailed it at last, a Tory budget. And then it all went uh, absolutely pear shaped. Uh, Quasi Quartang Trust went off. Yeah, interest rates uh, uh, soared. This, this is not. This is not a takeoff. It's just not. It's, it's more a holding pattern. 
Now maybe they have, they've got a, you know, maybe there will be another financial statement before a, a November election, or maybe they're saving something for their uh, election manifesto and setting traps think, for, mean, for Labour that way. What would Labour do? I will muster up some enthusiasm mm. for you, Anna. <laughs> of course, as the <laughs> Chancellor set out, he's right that inflation is now forecast. No, I'm just I'm, go I'm, back I'm to the Bank of England's Has the Telegraph target? given up on the Conservatives as well? It's sort of, you know, that is that where we're at? It's realism <laughs> well, as a journalist, isn't it? Look, the, the, the economy, <laughs> turbocharging the economy, the economy was not turbocharged. I don't even think Jeremy Hunt himself would claim that. And if you look at the growth figures, yeah. they would well, not... Well, exactly. The they would not, even the revised they growth figures. They would not figures. justify yeah. turbocharging. But, but while, you, while you pick up to do your mustering your enthusiasm, I'm just going to show you The Guardian, which is a last desperate act. Uh, obviously, Labour's view on that. And uh, your paper, The Mirror, uh, We Deserve Better, stagnant budget for a stagnant country by a stagnant government after 14 years in power. Is that the best you can do? So maybe you could um, summon the enthusiasm to counter... The Kind of those two left-leaning papers. <laughs> Inflation is coming down to the Bank of England's target. That's obviously a positive development. It acts like a, a tax um, eroding people's pay packets. So that's 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 welcome. How much the government can claim responsibility for it, I'm not so sure. But the fiscal plan that Rishi and Hunt set out was always that we will bring down inflation and then we will look to address the tax system and how we can uh, reduce the burden. But, you know, you know, ultimately, I think the, the fundamental problem remains, as Kevin has said, that we're going to have the tax, uh, the highest tax burden in seven decades at the end of this parliament, and we have to find a way to get back onto a lower tax footing in Britain because that's how we, uh, that's how we will grow the, as an economy. And I mean, yeah. I would also just say that you're slightly disappointed that Jeremy Hunt didn't do more on the spending side of the ledger. He talked about productivity gains, but how much is that going to play with voters? Well, it's three point four billion for you know bringing it up the archaic IT systems. Mm. In yes, the but voters service. have heard that before, haven't they? And I don't know how Georgia. supportive they yeah. are of trying to shoehorn uh, IT upgrades in the NHS. Yeah. Yeah. Ten or twelve billion disaster in the Labour era, actually. Yeah. Uh, but if you if you look at the guard. Uh, opening paragraph, the intro. It's it's the case. It's a case for the prosecution that the Jeremy Hunt will go into the election with the highest uh, taxes at the highest level since 1948, mm. and the threat of a fresh squeeze on public spending after pub uh, polling day. That's you know, that is the prosecution case. Pe most mm. you know, on average, people will be worse off yeah. at the, the, this coming election. Than they were. I, I at suppose the, last the only one. thing is, can they remind people why it's so high? Which is, first of all, the financial crisis, followed by the pandemic, followed by a war on, on European soil, and that and that's and what you, they maybe need missed to. You missed out a B word. Brexit. Yes. Four percent effect on GDP. Yep. I think over, we heard from uh, the OBR yeah. today. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Others say it'll be higher, but. Okay. But... Yeah. Anyway, we've got lots more to pack in. Uh, moving on, uh, Rishi Sunak promised to deliver the largest reduction in migration on record, but new figures suggest nearly two million people could arrive in the next five years. We'll discuss that next. In this study, we are trying to model fetal development. We are trying to model how the babies develop in the late stage of pregnancy. So uh, this started by looking at the amniotic fluid, which is a solution that uh, surround and protect the baby during development. And we look at the cells, at the various cell types that are present in this, uh, in this resource. Mm -hmm. Uh, we identified progenitors, we identified uh, cells that are stem cells and are specific to uh, certain tissues of the fetus. And we decided to try to grow them into what the, the press is calling mini organs. We prefer to call them organoids. The idea is to use these organoids to model fetal development, so to model how the human tissues are developing, uh, to use them to model disease. And so we try to do this with a disease that affects the development of the lung. And so what we've seen is that in the presence of this disease, the organoids that we grow are different from the one of normal babies. Uh, and based on this, uh, we expect in the future to be able to use this technology to test drugs that are specific for these babies, so in a personalized medicine manner, uh, and basically use these as a predictive model 
for how the pregnancy is going to unravel. This research is done both at UCL uh, and Greater Mostrate Hospital. And in the lab, uh, together with Professor Paolo De Copi, which is my mentor, uh, we put these cells into three-dimensional culture. So it's an or organoids are something that is getting quite established in medical technology. It's a discovery that is around since 2009. And these cells are basically grown in three dimension, in a bubble of gel and they expand and form these mini masses of tissue. The way we see it going forward is uh, to use this as advanced diagnostic method, because in theory, it should be able to predict how severe certain disease would be uh, as a drug testing uh, method, and, and then the sky is the limit. With this platform, we are able to access the pregnancy while the pregnancy is still going on. Okay. And this is very relevant because we can uh, theoretically intervene while the baby is still developing in a personalized manner. We don't really manipulate anything here. We just take cells out, expand them in culture, and that's it. There's no, mm, we don't bring them back. We don't make them into something that could develop in a fetus, an embryo, or whatever. We're simply taking a snapshot of what's the status of the tissue at that specific moment in development. Well, welcome back. You are watching the press preview with me now, Kevin McGuire and Annabel Denham. We continue our conversation about the budget. A couple of things um, struck probably all of us about what the Chancellor had to say. First of all, he wanted growth, but not driven by migration. Secondly, uh, that we still have 900,000 vacancies in this country. Um, and we have a huge number of working age people who still do not work. So how you square the issue of migration vacancies and getting people back to work it begins to be seen in some of these uh, these articles. That's right. So the Office for Budget Responsibility has upgraded um, its forecast for uh, migration. Um, it went up from just shy of 300,000 to 350,000 between now and 2028. E so each year. Each year, exactly. So there's a significant increase in the UK population um, over the next few years, um, though, of course, less than we've seen in the last couple of years where it's been six, 700,000. Now, a problem we have in the UK at the moment is that while GDP has generally been going up, albeit at a very, very small, um, a very, very small amount, GDP per capita has been decreasing. So while we have a large number of people coming into the UK, actually our growth is not matching that in the way that it ought to. A concern I also have is that high levels of immigration have covered up the problems that we have with worklessness in the UK because it's been allowed to mask them. If you can fill vacancies with foreign workers, um, perhaps through the or a shortage occupation list, then you can ignore the problem that actually growing numbers in Britain today are economically inactive. They're not working and they're not looking for jobs. We have an increasing number of people who are long-term sick mm. and yet we've got seven and a half million people on the NHS backlog, so we're simply unable to treat them. I mean, the problems f feel like they're very difficult to solve, and yet I'm not sure the can can be kicked down the road for much longer. Yeah, they it's, need it's on to the do front page of the Telegraph as well. Um, yeah. what, yeah, uh, Rishi Sunak's going to be furious when he finds out which uh, party's been in power for 14 years when this has been happening. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the, te the Telegraph mm -hmm. has that. Uh, the... Yeah, it's the bottom left, isn't it? Yeah, bottom left. Uh, one million more migrants to probably the economy, which they are. They're working mm -hmm. and paying their way. The number of uh, people of working age who aren't working is up 700,000 since uh, lockdown, since COVID, up to a decade high of 9.3 
million. Of course, that's got to be tackled. Labour accept that too. Liz Kendall made a speech on it the other day. But it's interesting if you look at the Times. Mm -hmm. uh, just before you know, some people go uh, bonkers, the people coming in pay their way. They it just point out from the o OBR figures that they'll contribute an additional 6.5 billion a year in tax revenues by 2028-29. Uh, that will result in a reduction in borrowing of 7.4 billion, uh, but the extra cost of public services, because of course people coming in will use them, is 6.1 billion. So they will they will be a net contribution. But that's not to say that tackling worklessness is is a real issue. Now some people will be disabled, some people will be sick. It's it's how can you help them stop getting disabled, sick in the first place, whether it's physically or, or, or mentally. And get the NHS and then, making this down yeah, to treat Exactly, people. and then yes. get, him, get him into work. You, no magic wand. I don't believe cutting benefits and taking a whip to people is is the way. We've, but run, just we've, run, out oh, oh. we've run out of time. We didn't get to the woolly mammoths back by 2028, <laughs> but we will soon. Uh, thanks to both of you. Uh, see you for the 11th. Thank you. <laughs>